I'm going to ask you to join me standing out of respect and reverence for the reading of God's holy, infallible word. Jesus told this story to his disciples. There was a certain rich man who had a manager handling his affairs. One day a report came to the manager, came to that the manager was wasting the employer's money. So the employer called him in and said, what's this I hear about you? Get your report in order because you're going to be fired. <laughs> Let's pray. Father in heaven. Father, I pray you'd bless the reading of your word this morning, Lord. As we examine this passage, Father, there's so much to the text. I pray that you'd speak to our hearts, Lord, even now. Help us to see what is you want us to see, to glean insight from your word, Lord. Not for information, Lord, but for application and for transformation, Lord. So I pray you'd bless the reading of your word this morning, Lord, and use me as your Conduit this morning, your very mouthpiece to speak your words to your people this morning. Father, we give you praise and glory and honor and thanks, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As we examine uh, today's text, I'm going to back up just a smidge. Last week when we were together, we talked about the parable of the lost son. Do you recall? Where the, I, and I read the lyrics to the song, When God Ran, that the running of the patriarch was considered undignified. And yet God ran to the lost sinner. The story of the lost son came on the heels of the lost coin. And I meant to share an illustration uh, a couple of times with, uh, with the last couple of weeks, and I didn't. It's actually Brother Glenn has uh, shared a story with me. If you ever see, he wears two rings, two rings on his hand, two wedding bands. They're on the same finger. If you ask him about it, it's a pretty cool story. So the story is essentially, and there's, I'll give you the, the, the cliff note, that he lost one. So the second one holds the first one on. Is that correct, Glenn? Is that about right? So there's a big story to it. It's an awesome testimony. But the point is uh, the lost ring. And so we had the parable of the lost coin. We talked about the significance of that. Then there was the parable of the, uh, the, the lost sheep. And what we've come to realize is that it's not about lost sheep and it's not about lost coins. It is about lost people that God is concerned with. Amen? Amen? So as we move into today's, listen, this is not. We, we are chronicling the life of Jesus Christ. And he tells the story of a lost sheep. It's not about the sheep. Then he tells the story of a lost coin to illustrate his point. But it's not about the coin. Then he tells the story of a lost son. It's about the lost people of the world. And the Bible says in the parable of the lost son, uh, the, the wayward son, it says that to illustrate his point more, Jesus tells the story of the lost son. So those three stories... If, you, if you're looking through the Gospels, you can miss this because they're not necessarily in order. But today, we're in Luke 16, and I'll go back. The, the, the story of the lost coin actually comes in, uh, the lost sheep is in Luke 15, 1 through 7. And then the lost coin proceeds in the subsequent passage, 8 through 10, and then the lost son does come from 11 through 32. In today's text, he goes into the story of the parable of the shrewd manager, which is what I began to read, the text. What's interesting is that these that is the, the succession of the stories. Okay, these are snapshots of Jesus' life. The gospel is not an autobiography of Jesus Christ. Somebody's penning the things that he's doing. They're writing these little snapshots of what's going on. So as you can see, Jesus is teaching about the lost, about lost people. So when we move into chapter 16, it says Jesus tells this story to his disciples. After he told the story of the lost son. Jesus told the stories to his disciples. There was a certain rich man who had a manager handling his affairs. One day a report came that the manager was wasting the employer's money. How do you think that went over? I mean, how do you think it would go over today? Well, your boss finds out you're wasting his money. You're not handling his affairs properly. What's interesting here is, what do we know about parables? We know that they are earthly stories with a heavenly meaning. So we have to dig a little deeper into this one. And to be honest with you, it can be a little confusing. So let's take a look. The, 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 man, the, the manager handling the affairs is wasting the employer's money. So the employer calls him in and says, hey, what's this I hear about you? Get your reports in order because you're going to be fired. 
Now, interesting enough, the reports that he's referring to are probably going to be beneficial to the manager's successor. Give me all your stuff, turn in all your stuff, take a hike. You're fired. So the manager thought to himself, now what? My boss has fired me. And I don't have enough strength to dig ditches, and I'm too proud to beg. Ah, I know how to ensure that I'll have plenty of friends who will give me a home when I am fired. <laughs> My passage is entitled, uh, Jesus ta uh, Tells the Parable of the Shrewd Manager. That's, that's how it reads in my Bible. Anybody's different? Unjust steward. The unjust steward? Unjust servant. Unjust servant. Anyone else? Unrighteous. 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 What'd you say? Glenn? I mean, uh, Vern? Crooked. One more time. Crooked manager. Crooked manager. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Dishonest manager. Nice. One more time. <laughs> All right. He says, ah, I know what I'm going to do to ensure that I have plenty of friends who will give me home when I'm fired. Back up to verse 3, would you, Amy? What I find interesting is the manager thought to himself, now back up to verse 2. The employer called him on it. He said, hey, dude, what's this I hear? What's this I hear? This guy can't even... He's busted. He, has, he offers nothing. He has nothing to say. I hear about you. Get your reports because you're going to get fired. The guy has nothing. So what does he do? He thinks, oh, shoot. In verse 3, he starts scrambling. The manager thought to himself, now what? What am I going to do? Oh, my goodness. What am I going to do? The boss has fired me. I don't have enough strength to dig ditches, and I'm, not, and I'm too proud to beg. This is interesting. When I, when I'm telling you, when I'm, when I'm preaching, if it, if, if, I always say if you can't say amen, you say ouch. Um, if somebody's stepping on your toes, I can promise you it's not me. I'm reading the text. I'm preaching the text line by line, word by word. It is what it is, thus saith the Lord. So if, it, if we have to do a self-examination sometimes, the word of God is tough. Amen. It's tough. In fact, there's nothing in the Bible that's easy that I can think of. The manager thought to himself, now what am I going to do? The boss has fired me. I don't have strength to dig ditches. If you study the passage, if you study the language, the Bible doesn't, he says, I don't have strength to dig ditches. It doesn't imply, the original language does not imply that the man is lame, that he has a bad back, that he has, you know, uh, he only has one arm. It doesn't apply that, imply that at all. The I don't have the strength to dig ditches. Somebody got a different translation? How's it read? Strength to dig ditches. Not strong enough for a laboring job. Good translation. Good translation. Okay, so if the boss fires me from being the manager and puts me in charge of digging and puts somebody else in charge of managing me, it's not a question of I can't do it. The question is I don't want to do it. It's not a, fa it's not a, it's not a matter of he can't. It's a matter of he won't. Now, we have to be careful because who is the employer in this parable? When you're talking about the earthly parable, he is the manager, or he's the owner. Of the, the, the. But if you're talking about the spiritual context, it's God. Right. Okay? Earthly story, heavenly meaning. Right. So God is the employer, and he's firing his manager. Who are God's stewards? Who are his managers? Right. We are. There's going to come a day, church, where you're going to punch your clock. Time is up. God's going to say, cash in your chips. You're done. It's over for you. Because you're mishandling the, my affairs. You are a poor steward of what I have given you. Your time. I didn't watch football at all. I think I watched one game this year. And, 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 and it was like, those games are three hours long. And you guys know I love football. God has watered down that love for football for me, and I'm glad. I burned three hours on a Sunday, whether it was right after church or later on in the evening, I'd watch that football game. Three hours of my time watching football. Do we spend three hours of our time doing other things? Last Saturday, we went out and knocked on doors. We, I, we didn't do it for three hours. 
And we come on a Tuesday night, we spend time investing in these children, and we only do it for three hours. Three hours is a long time. And most of us who watch sports or whatever on TV won't bat an eye at the length of time we sit in front of that tube. We're poor managers of our time. We're poor managers of our money. Now, people don't want to hear this, but it's true. I shared this before. When I got hired on the Hammond Police Department, I got hired. I was making 22 five. I thought I hit the jackpot. I said, man, I'll never need another raise. The more you earn, the more you spend. It's a fact. When we say we can't give, we can't, we can't, we can't, what we're really saying is we won't. It's true. The manager thought to himself, now what am I going to do? My boss has fired me, and I don't have the strength to dig ditches. In other words, all oh, this manual labor is bad for my hands. Don't want to do that. He's soft. Right? I'm just going to get calluses, get dirt under my nails. Exactly. Exactly. So the, he doesn't have the strength to dig ditches, and he's too proud to beg. Wow, he went from working to begging. He doesn't want to beg. Begging was uh, undignified as well. Nobody wants to beg. So let's see here. The manager thought to himself, okay, boss has fired me. I don't have strength to dig ditches. In other words, I'm not, I don't want to dig ditches. I'm too proud to beg. Ah, I know. I know how to ensure that I'll have plenty of friends who will give me a home when I am fired. Wow. Give me a home when I am fired. The Bible clearly teaches about those who are not willing to work. If you're not willing to work, the Bible says you, should, you won't eat. Okay, we have to work. But this is, a, this is an earthly story. But what is the spiritual implication? The spiritual implication is here is that God's calling you out because we're not being good stewards of our time, of our money, of the things that he has given us. People have told me, Pastor, I prayed that God would give me this house because I'm going to get away from money for a second. I prayed that God would give me this house, and I said, if God gives me this house, I will honor him with this house. I'm going to open it up and invite people in. I'm going to use my house to glorify God. Let me tell you, this, I love this church. I love the people in it. We have huge differences as far as the, the, from the rung of the ladder. I mean, not only in ethnicity, but in socioeconomic standing as well. It's huge, huge. And I have met some of the most generous people in this church. I'm not going to tell you who they are, but I know, I know for sure of people in this church who have blessed the socks off of other people in the church because the other people in the church were in need. And the people who have recognized the need and gave because that's what God would have them to do. Honoring God with their resources. I know that for sure. And it's more than one family here. And I won't, I won't point them out, but they probably know what I'm talking about. And, and that is what you're supposed to do. This is why God gives you. You are blessed to be a blessing. Amen. Okay, when we lose sight of that, when God increases our standard of living, we should increase our standard of giving. Amen. But we don't want to do that. We don't want to dig ditches. It's hard work. Well, no kidding. Okay? So he says, I'm going to find me a friend who's going to give me a home when I get fired. Well, that's pretty smooth. <laughs> and I want to check this out. Let's, let's get into this. So he invited each person who owed money. Let me back up. I want to back up. And I want to back up to the uh, verse 1. The end of verse 1. The manager was wasting the employer's money. Anybody's translation read different, anything other than money? Possessions. Thank you. Anyone else? Squandering his goods. Anything else? <laughs> Running up huge personal expenses. Okay, so the manager is mismanaging not only the money, but the, the stuff, the resources. If you look down at verse 5, he, the manager, invited each person who owed money, my translation says, to his employer. Anyone else read different? Verse 5, a word other than money. Debtors? Okay, anything else? Anyone? Debtors. 
So he invited each person who owed money or something. They're in debt. They owe something to this employer. So this manager invites them in to discuss the situation. He asked the first one, hey, man, how much money do you owe him? The man replied, well, I owe him 800 gallons. And listen, I want to read this to you. He asked the first one, how much do you owe him? Verse 5 says he owed him money. In my translation, the employer's money, the latter part of verse 1, money in verse 5. But then in verse 6, the man replied, I owe him 800 gallons of olive oil. Don't sound like money to me. It's money, church. I don't know what 800 gallons of olive oil cost you, but it wasn't free. So the manager told him, take the bill quickly, change it to, to, four, <laughs> change it to 400 gallons. What? Sneaky, sneaky, huh? Don't underestimate the sneakiness, okay? So he, he cuts it in half. He tells him, look, now your bill's 400 gallons. You're welcome. Don't tell nobody, okay? What is he saying? In essence, he's saying, you owe me, dude. You owe me. Don't forget about my generosity. I stole from my boss to help you out, but don't forget about my generosity. Never mind the fact that I'm crooked. I took care of you. Verse 7, and how much do you owe my employer? He calls the next guy, the next man. He says, I owe him 1,000 bushels of wheat. Wait a minute. How much do you owe my employer? We're talking about money according to verse 5. We're talking about money according to the latter part of verse 1. And this man replies in like manner, 1,000 bushels of wheat. I don't know how much 1,000 bushels of wheat costs, but I can assure you it is not free. Unless it's growing up in your backyard somewhere, it ain't free. Amen? It cost. I owe him 1,000 bushels of wheat. And then he replied, here, the manager said, take the bill and change it to 800 bushels. Interesting. Why on earth does the first guy get a 50% cut and the second guy gets a 20% cut? <laughs> I thought it was going to be 50-50. I thought it was going to go boom down the line. But it's not. Why? He's crooked. That's why. This dude, whatever it is that he wants from the 50% discount, is something greater that the other guy probably can't give him. Doesn't have the means. Maybe I want to give Frank, make him only owe me half, so that he can let me stay in his house because he's got air conditioning and a swimming pool. <laughs> and maybe I only chop Nick's in half, or not, I only knock off 200 bushels because Nick don't have a pool. I don't plan on staying with him because he ain't got no air conditioning. But, Nick has a sports package on the TV that Frank don't got. Okay, but staying with Frank's more important than watching the NFL ticket. So 200 bushels. You follow me? This guy's a dirty dog. He's looking out for himself. And he's using people. But what was the problem initially? The employer says, you're squandering my stuff. Whose stuff? My stuff. Who's the employer? God. Who's the steward? We are. Church, we are guilty of squandering God's stuff. Everything you have is his. Amen. Your time, the very air we breathe, the money in our pocket, all that stuff is his. And we often say, we can't, we can't. What we're really saying is we don't, we won't. I don't know what you're thinking. Pastor, you're talking about money. I ain't talking about your money. I'm talking about all your stuff. There's going to come a day where God's going to call in and say, look, you're squandering my stuff. When are you going to live up to what I created you to do? So look at verse 8. The rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. <laughs> I love that translation. Mine is the NLT. He says he had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. Somebody want to define shrewd for me? Anybody. Blurt it out. Like a big Bible study. Anyone? Uncanny. Very nice. Anyone else? I am not checking my text messages. I'm looking it up. Sneaky smart. smart. Clever. Clever. Anyone else? Conniving. Conniving. Sweet. Astute. Astute. Very good. Anyone else? Rotten. (laughs) Um, Shrewd is not really a bad thing. Not really. 
True to being smart, being astute, being wise, figuring out how to make things work for you. A person is shrewd when you give him five bucks and he knows how to turn it into 20. That's not a bad thing. So the verse says, the rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal. This guy is dishonest and he's a rascal. But he admired him for being so shrewd. This part of the text kind of confused me. Wait a minute. Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he's, he's telling him that the, that, the, that the manager is admiring the dishonest dude for being shrewd. So is Jesus saying we should be rascals? That we should sneak, conniving, be, sneak around and rip people off? That's not what he's saying at all. That's not what he's saying at all. Let's check out the text. This is good stuff, church. He admires him for being so shrewd. Look at the second part of the verse. And it is true that the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than the children of light. What are we talking about? Jesus is saying this. Look, in your generation, in your context, the lost are smarter managers of their money Smarter managers of their time, they're looking for a return. It's all earthly stuff, but they are much more aware and smarter about it than we are, the children of the light. That's what he's saying. He's saying that those people who are lost, they're going to take that money and they want to invest and make more money. They want to leave an inheritance for their kids. They're all focused on the here and now in this life. They're not thinking about an afterlife. That's what makes them fools. But in their context, they are smarter than we are in ours. Because we don't care about eternity. We don't think like they do. We don't invest like they do. We don't pour our time like they do. We don't, we don't, we don't plan like they do. The average Christian walks through life with his hand in his pocket and his head in the clouds, waiting for the rapture. That's the truth. We are poor stewards of what God has given us. I know a man who uh, he, said he, he said he had a hot tub, and he was going to use his hot tub as a ministry opportunity. <laughs> hey. I remember a guy on a video who said that, actually. He invited his Muslim friend over, and they were bubbling. That's what they call it. They're bubbling in the hot tub. He said, and he got saved in the hot tub. You use what you got for the glory of God. We don't do that. What we want, we want for us and for our use, we don't think about kingdom work. We just don't. And time is a big one. Our time is a big one, probably much more significant than our money. But our money is another one. We say, well, I don't have, I don't have. Verse 9, here's the lesson, Jesus says. Use your worldly resources, money, time. Car, house, hot tub, use your stuff and make friends. Then when your earthly possessions are gone, they will, be, they will welcome you into the eternal home. You see what he's saying? He's saying if you, use, if you use your earthly stuff that God has given you, use it to reach people who are lost. You reach them, use your stuff for spiritual things. And then when all that stuff is gone, what's the verse saying? Here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Okay? Well, that sounds pretty worldly. Then, when your earthly possessions are gone, they will, well, they are your friends that you've made. They will welcome you into an eternal home. Not your stuff, the friends you've made. The implication is you're using your earthly stuff to reach friends for eternity. And when all your stuff is gone, you know when that's going to be? Check this out. You think all that money's going to save you? It's not. You think all those cars or motorcycles or hot tubs or swimming pools and all that stuff, all that stuff, you think any of that stuff is coming with you? It's not. It's all hay and stubble. There's no U-Hauls following the hearse to the funeral, uh, to, the, to the cemetery. You're not taking it with you, church. You're not. And so you will be robbed. You will be stripped away of all your stuff. You're going to cash it all out one day. And it is not going to mean squat. It's going to be gone. You're going to leave it for somebody else. 
illustrating Jesus' point about the earthly people, carnal-minded people, versus the spiritual. We don't think about the spiritual. And some of us, some Christians will be, oh, I'm upset, Pastor. I can't believe you said that. Well, you can be upset. Maybe you're the exception. Maybe you're the super saint who walks around in the spirit all day. But if you are, and I don't mean this to be, I mean this sincerely. If that's you, praise the Lord. Most Christians don't. They don't. They will welcome you into an eternal home. Use your earthly stuff for spiritual reasons. Listen to this. People, I just shared this. People say, I don't give, Pastor, because I don't have. That's not true. That's not true. I, uh, we find a time. We find a time. We make the time to do the things we want to do. I shared this before, and I know I'm no Cubs fan. You guys know this. So if I had some free cup tickets in my pocket, I would give them away. I'm not kidding. And I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I just don't, I'm not a Cubs fan. I'm not going to waste my time going to the north side, fighting traffic over there to watch a game that's about a team I don't really care about. I would give them away. I would give them away. And I bet you, if you're a diehard Cubs fan, you've been waiting 110 years for that World Series, I bet you if I gave you those tickets, I bet you you'd clear your calendar. I bet you you'd find it. You'd make sure that you'd get there. Vacation day, trade days, call in sick. <laughs> Whatever it takes, you're going to make sure you get there. I don't have the time, Pastor. I don't have the money. You go find a way. Free tickets to the Cubs game in your pocket? Come on, man. You're going to pass that up? Why? Because we make time for the things that are important to us. We could say, oh, well, this is important to me. That's important to me. That's important to me. You know what? You'll see it. Your time and your money will show you what's important to you. Go pull your bank statements and look through them if you think I'm full of it. Take the highlighter, a pink one, and highlight all the times you went out to the movies. Take a green one. And highlight all the times you went out to eat. Take a blue one and li- highlight all the other stuff. Take an orange one and highlight all the spiritual things. Money you've given to families in need, tithing, offerings, whatever, whatever, whatever. Just donations you've given out. Highlight those. And then do the math and then burn the paper because you're not going to want nobody to see it, I promise you. <laughs> I'm telling you. Your earthly possessions are gone. They, your friends, will welcome you to an eternal home. He says, if you're faithful, Jesus says, if you're faithful with little things, you'll be faithful with larger ones. When he's talking about the the, the little things, he's talking about the earthly things. The larger things are the spiritual things. And we're not faithful with earthly things. We're not going to give, you're not going to get the blessings of spiritual things. You're not. Your children, you buy your child. I don't mean to be offensive, but if you buy your child an old school flip phone, if you got an old school flip phone, I'm not busting on you. <laughs> Just saying. You buy your child an old school flip phone, and they drop it in the water or something, the toilet bowl. Bloop. Oh, shoot, Dad, I lost my phone. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, you know, I need a new one. So I get you an old, another one, another old school flip phone, probably more older than the one you dropped in the toilet bowl. <laughs> but you tell me, Dad, I want an iPhone. You think I'm going to get you an iPhone? You can't take care of a flip phone. You're lucky if I don't get you a rotary phone. You can't take care of something smaller. You want something greater? It doesn't work that way, and it doesn't work that way with God. We say, I want the bigger things, God. I want the better things, God. Show me. Give me the pearls, Lord. And God said, you can't be faithful with the little things that I showed you. This is a fact, church. This is a fact. Christians wonder why we're stuck and we don't grow. Well, we're not faithful with the little things. He says, if you're faithful with the little things, you'll be faithful with large ones. But if you're dishonest with the little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. If you're untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the riches of heaven? What if, and if you are not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with your own things? Say, it's my flip phone you dropped in the toilet. 
Dad, can I borrow your phone? Sure, I let you borrow my phone, and then you leave it at the park. Well, you know what'll solve this problem, Dad, is if you buy me my own phone. It doesn't work that way, church. We need to be faithful in the little things. Amen? And one of the little things is our time. We can't find the time. What we're really saying is we won't make the time. That's what we're saying. These children on Tuesday nights for the last several months that we've been meeting here, we, the leaders, have made the time, made the time to get here even when they couldn't. Why? Because it was important to them. Verse 13, no one can serve two masters, for he he will hate one and love the other. You will devote to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Some uh, translations say mammon, meaning stuff, things. If you, listen, money shakes people to the core. It just does. When pastors preach on money, People shut down. They don't want to hear it. I understand that. I used to be that person. Oh, money grubbing preacher going to preach about money. Hey, it's the full counsel of God. This is the passage we're in. This is the next event in Jesus' life. If you're here today, it's by a divine appointment, church. You cannot serve both God and money. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. People who truly love something. I'll go back to the Cubs fan. They buy jerseys. They buy hats. Well, this stuff ain't cheap. They got mugs. They got all kind of stuff. Seat cushions. They got all kind of stuff. They're invested in their team. When a person loves God, they invest in the things of God. Their time and their money and all their stuff, is they're all in. All the chips are in. When you truly love something. If you're married, you understand this. If you have children, you understand this. You're all in. That's my kid. No matter what, come hell or high water, that's my child. Right? We're going to figure it out. We're going to work through this. So when you love something, when you truly love something, you're all in. You don't hold back. You don't give a little bit. You give it all. Amen? Amen? So if you love God, you're pouring everything into the things of God. Missionaries are great examples. Now, everybody is not called to be a missionary, so I'm grateful that God has not called me to be a missionary in a foreign country. That is something that I, God would have to give me the grace to do that. Because that's a, that's, but, but nobody can question a, mission, a missionary's heart, that they're all in. You can't question that. You can't say they don't love God. You must be out your mind. They're in a foreign country raising their own money, living, learning the language and learning the culture. You can't tell me they don't love God. It's evident by their time, their talent, and their money. It's all in. So those people, a missionary, for example, will love God and hate the world. Let's take Mother Teresa, for example. Or those who love the world will be shrewd about the things of the world and discard the things of God. It doesn't, most, you can't, you can't love them both. You can't love them both the same. That TV show, that Sister Wives, have you seen that? Raise your hand if you've seen that. That's a weird movie, that's a weird show. Guy has three, four, five wives, I'm like, I don't, yeah, I'm barely getting by with one. I don't know how he does it. I don't get it. (laughs) <laughs> amen. I'm getting some amens. I don't know how they do it, but what my point is, they, the, the, the man, and, and it's, it's they, they hear me, listen to me, hear me. I'm not advocating this at all. But the guy seems noble. He seems sincere. He says, I love them all the same. There ain't no way, dude. There ain't no way you can love them all the same. If I give all of my heart to Tina, how much is left over for my other wife? <laughs> So that means I got to cut in half and split, and split it with the other wife. And then cut it in a third and give it to the third. But come on, that don't work. You can't put your heart all into something and yet reserve a part of that heart to be all into something else. Right. It just doesn't work. 100% is all you got. Right. That whole 110%, that, you don't have that. You got All you got is 100. 
And if you put the 100 into your relationship with God, you got nothing left for nothing else. That's what Jesus is saying here. Now, check this out. <laughs> uh, so the Pharisees, who dearly love their money, <laughs> just throwing it out there, uh, heard all of this and scoffed at him. The original language says basically they snubbed their nose at him. That he said there, he said, then he said to them, man, I love Jesus' style. Oh, man, calls you out. He says, you like to appear righteous in public, but God knows your heart. He's talking to the, the Pharisees. What this world honors is the testimony in the sight of God. What happens is this. The, listen to me, church. The Pharisees believed that the financial blessings that they had, if they were well off, that it was proof of God's blessings in their life. Must be doing something right. I'm loaded to the gills. You must be doing something wrong because you dirt poor. True or false? False. Not even close. But that's what they believed. So when Jesus is teaching and preaching this, the Bible says they got mad at him. They're like, yeah, whatever, dude. Because he's preaching something they don't want to hear. Sound familiar? Church, we hear what we want to hear. We don't want the full counsel of God. Why? Because I said earlier, it's tough. When the Bible hits you right betwixt the eyes, you got no choice but to say, you know what? I'm sorry, Lord. I repent. Or saying, I don't care what you do. I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to do my own thing, God. That's really your choice. When, the truth, when you're confronted with the truth of God, you have a choice. Line yourself up with God or thumb your nose at him. That's the truth. Yep. And most of us will thumb our nose at him, but we won't really thumb it at him. We'll make an excuse or rationalize it or water it down. For example, the I don't have time to give. I don't have money to give. How can you say such a thing, Pastor? We make excuses. We rationalize what we want to do and what we don't want to do. And we'll condemn other people for the very things that we do. He said to them, you like to appear like you're righteous in public, but God knows your heart. Go ahead, put it around here, thump your chest, act like you're all that. What this world honors, money and power, and money and power is honored in our world. Don't think it ain't. Don't think it ain't. He said, what this world honors is detestable in the sight of God. Go to the Amen. next verse for me, Amy. He says, until John the Baptist, check this out. Until John the Baptist, the law of Moses, and the messages of the prophets were your guides. <laughs> the law was your guides. But now the good news of the kingdom of God is preached. And everyone is eager to get in. Huh. But <laughs> so he's saying, listen, Old Testament, he's saying this is clearly the dividing line between the old, the dispensation of the law, and the dispensation of grace, and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus is saying it's here. Okay? This is not, it is not to discard the law, but to fulfill it. There's a transition of Jesus is coming. He says, until John the Baptist, the law of Moses, and the messages of the prophets were your guides. But now the good news of the kingdom of God is preached, and everyone is eager to get in. Get into what? Get into the kingdom. Right. Everybody wants in. They're kicking and scratching and booting down the door. The problem is everybody wants to get in on their own merit and how they think they ought to get in. Well, you know what? There's one God, many avenues. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. It's not on our terms. It's on his terms. It's how he says. And so we want to enter into the kingdom. We're ready to kick the door down. And Jesus says, look, you want to do it your way. Everybody wants in, but there ain't a million ways in. There's one door and I'm it. Come on now. Say it. Amen? Say it. Go to the next verse. But that doesn't mean that the law has lost its force. Verse 17, another translation. Anybody, please. Anyone? Is that the first part of verse 17? Verse 17, for me, says, but that doesn't mean the law has lost its force. Yours doesn't have that? Anybody else have that? For the least stroke of the pen to fall, to drop from the law of God. <laughs> what does it mean? Jesus said, I came to fulfill the law. I didn't come to abolish it. Jesus is the culmination of the law. It's all come together. The law is perfect. The law is the law of love. And Jesus, what is he talking about, though? We're talking about 
the manager, who got fired because he's a poor steward. <coughs> the law tells you how to live, period. Period. And we should strive, the Bible says, to live as one who will be judged <coughs> under the law. The Bible says when you break one of the laws, you've broken them all. So we should strive to live a life that honors God. Grace doesn't mean we just throw caution to the wind and do what we want, live our life however we want. Jesus said, look, the Old Testament, the law still applies. He says it still applies. It has not lost its force. It's easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for the smallest point of God's word to be returned or, or, or dissolved, right? Or overturned, my translation says. Listen what he says. For example, a man who divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery. A man who divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery. Now, that's the law of God. I know tons of people who are divorced and the circumstances are, there's, there's, a, there's a huge, from one end of the spectrum to the other. He says it's adultery. People tell me, Pastor, that's offensive to me. Thus saith the Lord. Right. Okay, I'm not trying to be harsh. What I am saying is, thank God for his grace. Amen. His grace is enough. Marrying somebody and devoting your life to that somebody ain't no easy thing. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and for those of you who are not yet married and think you're going to get married and live happily ever after, I'm here to tell you it's a big fat lie that doesn't exist. <laughs> happily ever after doesn't exist. We have to strive. Okay, it's work. I mean, we love each other. We're committed to each other, but it's not going to be easy. And for some people, there's, there's, there's reasons in the scripture that allow divorce because of the hurt and the pain that comes with it. But it was not God's design. God's design is two people together forever. Okay, and so if you're here today and you're like, you know what, I, I've been divorced. I'm not condemning you. I'm not. Jesus says a man who divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery. And anyone who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. What's his point? His point is saying, back to the law. It hasn't changed. Okay, so here we are with grace. Praise the Lord. The gospel is being preached. There is grace. Praise God. But it doesn't abolish the law. That doesn't mean that you can run around and just throw your wife out like yesterday's garbage because you're done with her. Oh, God's grace. He forgives. No. No. Amen? That's a double amen. Amen, sister, you're right. So we're saying, okay, on one hand, divorce is, is, is you divorce, you're committing adultery. If you marry somebody else, the Bible clearly teaches that the law is still the law. But what about Jesus? He came, there's grace. The law is still the law. But thank God for his grace. You know why? Because we're a hot mess and we can't keep that law. No, so we can't keep it. So why even try? Because the Bible says to live as one who will be judged under the law. And what is this coming on? It's coming on the heels of Jesus talking about a shrewd manager, the man who uses his brain to manage the affairs of the world and the carnal things of life. And the children of light, we don't apply the same shrewdness to the spiritual things in our life. Woe to us is what he's saying. If you're here today and you're like, well, you know what, Pastor, this doesn't relate to me. Well, praise God. But I'm here to tell you, most Christians, a large percentage of them, can do better. We can do better as God's stewards. There will come a time where he's going to cash you out because, you're not, because your time is up. And you're going to look back and you're going you're to look at all the time, all of the resources, all of the things that God has blessed you with that you've squandered. You've just wasted. There's some of you here today, you don't really know what that is. You don't know how to serve the Lord. But you know what? Your time is something that, that values God. I'm going to cover these two verses real quick. And then we'll, we'll close. Somebody, uh, somebody pull up Luke chapter 12, verse 33 and 34. 12, verse 33 and 34, and then we'll close. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I, don't, I really don't know what to do. Start with your time. Start with your time. It's the easiest thing. It's the easiest thing. It's not simple. Or should I say it's simple? It's your time. It's just not easy because it's a sacrifice. 
start with your time. And you say, oh, you want me to come to church? You want me to come? Don't come here. If you don't want to come here, go somewhere else. Do kingdom work. And to do kingdom work, typically we got to get outside the building anyway. But why don't you just carve out a small portion of your time that you're not giving while I spend time in my quiet time? That's, that's wonderful. That's your personal relationship with God. But that is not kingdom work. Kingdom work. See the need, meet the need. We have some people in the church that are doing that, and I'm just so grateful for that. But we all need to do a better job. When we went out and knocked on the doors last Saturday, one of the things that I kept saying to people was I realized we've been in this community over five years now, and we have not done a good job of reaching out. We have not. We've done a little, but not a good job at all. We need to do better. If we say we love the Lord. You got that verse? Yeah. Read it. Sell what you have and give all. Buy and sell one bag that you do not have a hole. The treasure in the heavens that does not fail. Where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I'm going to ask the praise team to come forward as I close with this final thought. Read the last part of that verse again. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We put money and time into the things that are important to us. That's the truth. That's the truth. A person who likes to drink spends a lot of time in bars. A per drinking, doing the things they like to do. They spend their time and their money. Am I advocating drinking? No. Those who like football are going to invest their time watching the NFL, buying jerseys, and rooting their team on. Their time and their money. Their NFL package. Those who like fishing are going to have nice fishing poles and lures and tackle boxes. And they're going to bolt and they're going to sit out. I, this is why I can't stand fishing. I don't have the patience for it to sit there. And... You can have it. Okay? I, I, don't, I don't have the patience or the time to go fishing. But some people like to fish. And you know what happens? They disappear in the summertime. They disappear during that season. Hunting season. They disappear. They go out to the field and they're hunting whatever they hunt. Campers disappear. They go camping. the time. We make the time. We invest our money in the things that are most important to us. The very people who say they don't have to give, I promise you, if you look at your finances, if you look at your time, you will find you have it. You've just been a poor steward. When we say we love God, ask yourself this question. Say, do I really love money more than I love God? And say, no, I don't. I don't. I'm not me. No way. Then ask yourself this. Do you give? Do you give? Do you give frequently? See, giving breaks the power of money. It does. Here's a good question. Here's a litmus test. I'm guilty of this church. When my kids were little, 4th of July, I can go work a side job somewhere where they're going to pay me triple time. Got a fireworks stand, making sure they don't get robbed. The whole day, cash. The IRS is going to come for you now. And I would do it and neglect my family, my wife and my kids, to make the money. And the excuse I would use, hey, it's just the 4th of July. We'll celebrate on the 5th. And we did. I look back now, you couldn't pay me enough to work a holiday, I don't have to work. It's not about the money. It's about the time that I have with my family that I'm not getting back. I wouldn't do that today. You ask yourself, are you a good steward? If the Lord was to show up in your presence today and manifest himself in, in, in a personal form and speak to you, and dialogue with you, would he tell you, hey, you do a great job of giving me your time. You're a great manager. You're a great steward of the resources I've given you. Would the Lord say that to you? Or would he say, you know what, son, you need to do better? Or, you're fired. Someone else needs to step up and take your place because you're doing a lousy job.